The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, it's 106. We're going to start presentations at 1.10. So Ghost Maze, just get started. Um, you don't have to come down here yet, but just make sure you're ready. Um, so just a brief um, going over what we're doing today. Um, presentations. I hear a lot of really good energy in the room, so I hope to hear that when you come down and tell us about your, about your games and all the foibles, all the things that went wrong, all the things that went right. Um, hopefully this is a really good prep for you for our next assignment, which is going to be much, much longer. Um, so after we get through our pre with presentations, we'll take a brief break. And then we're going to just jump right into Project 4. Um, I'll introduce Project 4 again, um, going through all the boring slides with all the deadlines and stuff. Um, if you want to follow, when I get to that, if you want to follow along on Stellar, I just updated the, um, the Project 4 assignment today to make sure that the deadlines were correct. Um, and we'll double check that again as well. Um, unfortunately, Pablo, who came to us in the beginning of the semester, is not here with us in person, but he will be here with us on Skype. Um, he's in Geneva right now, but he'll be talking to us about um, what they're looking for for Project 4. Um, in particular, we're going to be introduced to six different game topics, ga uh, game design topics, and you're going to choose one of them. Um, we're not necessarily making your choice today. Um, we're going to do brainstorming today. We're going to have people um, form up into brainstorming groups around these topics to talk about them. And then you will have over the weekend to talk about it on the mailing list, to read some of the, the resources and some of the materials we posted to Stellar to see which topic you're most interested in. And we're going to start the day off Monday with forming teams. So we got a bit, a bit longer time to form teams, um, a bit longer time to really think about the, the topic and to think about the, what the project's going to be. Um, again, you're going to have more time to actually do concepting on this project. It's an eight-week project, nine weeks if you count spring break, um, and which you shouldn't. We designed it as an eight-week project. Um, <laughs> What's that? Not spring break. I said no. Yeah, no, not yeah. Don't yeah. Don't work on spring break. Um, <laughs> like you were like you were going to. Um, any quick questions before we start? We got two minutes left. Any quick questions you might have had about Project Three, about turn-ins? Hmm. I said don't work to work during spring break. We designed we designed this as an eight-week project. For Project Four is an eight-week project. We designed it so that you are not working on the project over spring break. <laughs> What's that? Oh, shh. It's... You could give me some details about what I'm screwing up over here. So do we have a fall break? Do we not, what, what, don't we have a week-long break? Thanksgiving break? It's 70 degrees outside. I'm in a different place right now. All right. Uh, so, Ghost Maze, um, come on down and make sure your projector, uh, if you're going to use a projector, it all works. Um, and. What's up? I still didn't understand. No, just like before, it's just you only need as many people as you need to present to come down. Uh, so, if you don't remember, our game was Ghost Maze, and we'll run you through a quick refresher of what the game actually was first so you remember what it is. Uh, so here we have our character in a maze. You've just woken up and you're in the dark maze. All you have is your lantern. And so your objective is to explore the maze, avoid ghosts, and drop beacons to help you explore the maze, and then find a key, which will then unlock an exit for you to get out of the maze. And so there are different effects that happen during the game, such as um, your sanity starts decreasing as the game goes, goes on. And then randomly, as your sanity starts getting lower and lower, your movement will get impaired randomly, and, and the light will turn red, as you can see in this picture right here. And then another interaction that we had uh, was when you get close enough to a ghost, your sanity starts decreasing faster. So the light turns blue to let you know that you're too close to a ghost and you need to get away from that ghost. Yeah, so a few things that went right was that um, it was hard to balance everyone's schedules, but everyone was pretty flexible in terms of what features they were working on. So people would adapt to the features that needed to be done at that time. Um, so like being like flexibility was, I think, um, something that went more or less well in terms of like working on what needed to be worked on. Uh, second thing that went right was 
user experience. So we spent a lot of time focusing on user experience and playing with the camera, playing with shadows, playing with the player movement. Um, we spent a lot of time like putting in graphics and audio so that it seemed a little more realistic to really put you in the context that you were in a dark maze and lost. Um, a few things that went wrong is we started out using Flexel, but it took us a few days and we still couldn't get up a dev environment running. So uh, we decided to switch over to Unity. Um, one, that was like a pretty wise choice, but we made it pretty late. Um, we found that collaborative coding on Unity was really hard. Um, certain changes like to the main scene would, like they wouldn't merge well. Um, and so also when we were working on different branches and then tried to merge back into master, it seemed like people's changes were lost or overwritten. So we found that Unity wasn't great in terms of like having a big team project where a lot of people are coding at once. And sometimes we just reapply changes um, like onto the master branch. Um, something else is like we all had really busy schedules. People were out of town, in town, like could only work on the project at certain points. Um, so I think something that helped um, with that was at the beginning we did a pretty good job of delegating um, tasks to people who could work on the project earlier. But then later on it was pretty like haphazard in terms of who was available at one time. So maybe um, reevaluating priorities as the project went on would have been, I think, really helpful. So lessons learned. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on our user experience. Um, because we had a 3D perspective game, there was a lot of thought that went into how the light was hitting the player, how to get the shadows to cast properly, how the player knows that the player is in a maze, and um, being able to move around and understand how your sanity is decreasing. We spent a lot of time testing that. Uh, working early and quickly. This was partly hindered because we lost like at least four days of work because we were trying to get Flixel set up and then it just didn't work and we had to switch to Unity. So basically starting over from scratch. Um, working early and quickly is super important because uh, we ended up having to drop quite a few features because we didn't get enough done on time. And we also learned that working in 3D is very, very hard. Um, we were originally going to do a 2D game and then thought, oh, how hard would it be to, we have a 2D game, but let's just give it a 3D perspective. That was not a good idea. Um, doing the textures took a long time. It ended up looking really, really nice, as you can see in the pictures, but the time investment was a huge time investment that we could have used to put in uh, some more complex mechanics into our game. And future improvements. Um, team communication and availability is a huge one. Um, we, as Rachel said, we had a task assigned at the beginning, but then due to people's schedules, uh, we didn't really take that into account when we made the initial task list. So people ended up having to pick up other people's tasks, and it became very hard to figure out who was working on what. And uh, scheduling meetings was near impossible. Um, getting familiar with the game engine. Um, using Unity at first was very hard because we weren't sure how the scenes work, and Eventually, we figured out that if we make most of the stuff dynamically generated, then we can just worry about the code and not have to worry about all the user interface stuff that Unity does. Um, and that would have made our game uh, develop a lot quicker. And setting deadlines is very important. We had a lot of tasks laid out, but we didn't set strict deadlines for when we wanted each task to be assigned, or when we wanted each task to be finished. And that would have helped push along our game and get some of the more mechanics that we wanted in. Yeah, I think like something we a little bit overlooked is like what when we were gonna plan on doing our testing sessions because um, like we should have set the internal deadlines to match the testing sessions so that we get as much feedback as possible. Um, but like that said, we still like got something out of the testing sessions, so that was good. Um, I think that's yeah, all we have. That's it. So I don't know if you guys have questions. All right, thank you. Sure. from Team Hardcore Dragon, and as a refresher, I mean, our game is about being a hardcore dragon, so to us that meant uh, raising villages, being chased down by knights, and accumulating a horde of gold that you have to protect from looters, and we all were like pretty excited about this, this idea, and that was probably like the best thing about the project as a whole, is it, it was a fun idea, and like um, even when we like got bogged down with work from other classes or like something the emerged didn't go through correctly or there was a bug and we couldn't understand why it was happening. It was like still like really fun to be like, okay, I really need this like to make this dragon like, you know, set this village on fire and I want to do this because that's awesome. Um, <laughs> and another thing that worked is that we um, use um, Getter which integrates with um, uh, GitHub to, um, whenever something is pushed 
um, it'll show up on to the right and you can link to it and um, add everybody who's on your project is on the Gitter um, chat. So it was easy to keep track of who was working at what time, who was online at that time, and who you could ask uh, for help to let you debug whatever was going wrong. Um, another thing that helped was Trello is actually a really good tool. Um, last project I personally used just Google Docs, um, but Trello is much easier to like look at something, drag it, oh, I'm doing this right now, adding yourself to things and like breaking it down to simpler tasks. It's all very easy on Trello. It's very like, I mean, it's built for this. So it made long-term goal planning a lot easier. And um, you could see at this moment who was supposed to be doing what. Um, unfortunately, um, the idea was also like a downside to the project because it was like hardcore dragon it. I want to do so many things with this idea. Uh, I want to, you know, like, when I blow fire on this thing, I want it to, 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 like, turn into a crumbled building and become a pile of flames, and it'll be awesome. And, like, that's not necessarily at the top of the feature list, obviously, because um, we have other mechanics that are more important than that. But it, we kept coming up with these, like, little additions that would make the game a lot more, like, cool or awesome, but weren't, or hard to prioritize and just way too much to stack on top of the game. Um, so that was a downside, <laughs> and we, it was just hard to control our, uh, the, like, it was hard to scope the game down to the five-minute game we needed to create for the project. Um, Gitter was good with the, with the repo, and if everybody was on and everybody used it all the time, it, was, it would be ideal, but since a lot of us are on the go and, like, you know, working on other things and, like, in classes while people are working, um, using something else might have been better, like GChat or Facebook, like something you can you access from a smartphone or something, and more instantaneous. Um, I mean, we would just get like, if you weren't on Gitter at the time, it would send you a notification being like, you missed these messages, which is almost as like delayed message as email. So like, it was kind of pointless, other than the fact that it was integrated with GitHub and you could see who was online at, at the same time as you. Another thing that didn't work is that meetings are really, really hard to coordinate with like seven people. And what ended up really, what ended up happening was that um, we would all be like, okay, so half of us are free this day and like, you know, six of us are free this other time. Uh, let's meet then. And then we wouldn't decide a specific time within the time we were free to meet. And then by the time we noticed this, it would be like that day and it was just hard to coordinate everything um, after, you know, it got to that point. So for the future, um, I believe we have to have a fully dedicated Scrum Master. And I really mean fully dedicated, not Scrum Master, AKA programmer on the side, or Scrum Master also gets music done in play tests, well, does play testing, everybody play tests, but like fully dedicated Scrum Master to make sure that everybody's on task, that the meetings will get scheduled, and that the tasks are prioritized. And if something falls through, they're the person to talk to. They're the person who's going to like make you stop freaking out that this t task took like three times as long as you estimated it for. Um, we didn't have this one person dedicated to that. Everybody was like a jack of all trades in our, in our uh, group. So not having that one person to talk to, go to, uh, made um, task prioritization really fuzzy and made everything kind of come together really late and um, it was hard to hold people accountable because there wasn't that one person who was on top of everybody. Um, another thing we had to do earlier would be feature cutting because if you don't cut features defini definitively earlier, you'll still have it lingering on some people's minds like, oh, I have to do this so that in the future, you know, we're gonna maybe use this feature. Um, but if you f cut these features early, then you like limit the propensity to have bugs or uh, stuff like that, and like, while it's unfortunate that you have to cut features, it's necessary. So, doing it earlier is the best time to do it. Uh, another thing is, like I said before, our native messaging system, Gitter was cute, but it didn't like actually work in the way that we wanted it to work. It wasn't instantaneous between all members. I mean, it's hard to find a messaging system that everybody likes, but I think something like Gchat or Facebook messaging, something instantaneous like that that most people use already um, should be 
uh, used as a, as a group so that everybody can be on the same page and like have an ins access to the instant messaging. Um, and yeah, so that's, our game is there if you want to play it. <laughs> Anybody? Questions? So if you were to do feature cutting early, did you feel like you had the information in order to do that? So there was some stuff that like, after even the half halfway point that we could have cut features, but instead of the halfway point, we did like you know two days ago, which is too late um, already. So like even earlier than that, it doesn't have to be like day one feature cutting. Um, just some, at some like maybe like points throughout and be like what features at now that I'm here, what features look like they're not going to get through. Um, and with this dedic dedicated scrum master who's like looking through looking at people and how they're struggling with certain tasks. Um, maybe people don't know like exactly what their pace is internally, but from an outside perspective, a uh, Scrum Master might be able to um, more accurately help with estimates and stuff like that. So a uh, dedicated Scrum Master would help with early feature cutting as well, probably. This is a Unity project, right? Yeah, a Unity project, yeah, sorry. We actually didn't have that many problems with merging because we had, I think, at least one of us was uh, really experienced with Unity, so that was lucky, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so our team is MIT Simulator 2014. So our basic concept was you play as a certain dean of MIT, you may all know, and you're making decisions that trade off between the endowment uh, wealthy donors and student approval. And the basic goal of the game is to try and survive as long as possible while shitty things happen to the institute. So what went right in our project? I think what went right in our project is um, we connected with our audience. So, <clears throat> you know, a lot of MIT students know what it's like to be at MIT and they know like the setting, they know the administrator, we're not really pointing at, but we kind of are. And so a lot of people connected very well with our game, and uh, so they enjoyed it, um, and were able to understand it easily in their own terms. So um, second thing that went well is that humor works. Um, a lot of our things in our game were like kind of unpolished and kind of like slapped together, but because we had like taken the time to make them funny and make them entertaining, people were okay with like losing all their money in one turn uh, <laughs> accidentally because, hey, the description of it was funny. Um, and so the third thing that went well is that simple is okay. Uh, we ended up having like very few core mechanics, but then because of the setting that we had and because people connected well with our game, um, I think people were still able to get, uh, well, uh, we think people were still able to get enjoyment out of the game. Uh, because of those. So now, what went wrong? So first, Hexflixel, aka, what do you mean it's not on Stack Overflow? So Hexflixel, um, while it did play well with version control, and I heard some horror stories about Unity version control, Hexflixel played pretty well with version control, but if you ever had an issue, you were pretty much out of luck. You could, search on, you could search on Google and you get like zero results. Um, sometimes the uh, official documentation wouldn't even turn up on a Google search result. So yeah, the documentation was a little bit lacking. Um, I think the second thing that we could have improved on is that paperwork is not management. And I think like um, in the class in particular, this isn't emphasized enough is that you can do all these agile development methods, like you can have a sprint task list and everything, but unless if you actually have people who are actively taking charge and managing the project, I think um, <coughs> like stuff will still won't get done. And I think that's um, something that could be improved in the future in this class is like spend less time worrying about paperwork, spend more time actually like, you know, uh, teaching about how to handle personal situations, like what happens if someone doesn't uh, doesn't have time, or what happens if somebody you know like does this. 
And so teaching those, I, like learning those managerial skills isn't a trivial task. And I think like in the beginning, we like underestimated how, how much those issues would be a roadblock to progress. And then third thing that went wrong, I guess, is that um, responsibility is shared. So even if somebody has a role assigned to them, we should all still like take the time to make sure that like everybody is completing their role. So just making sure that like people are checking other people, make sure they're just to make sure tasks don't like fall between the cracks and stuff. And so yeah, overall people people do like the idea of uh, playing as a certain dean of MIT and uh, I'm gonna do it around. Okay. Any questions? So what would you do differently? Like, um, like, not, not, like not necessarily things about the hacks console, because mm -hmm. that's basically the only yeah. way. Yeah. Um, but um, when it comes to your management, the, the management stuff you're talking about, what would you want to, to do differently, or like, what particular would you want? Did you, what mm. particular problems did you have that you know you're going to have in the future that you need to have strategies for? Yeah. I, I think one thing that we would do differently is like take project management, like more more of a, more as like a people problem than like a paperwork problem um because i think like because uh, i think like we kind of just assume that by filling in the sprint task list and like by like writing git commit logs we magically work together as a team but i i think like um yeah i think in the future just like taking a more active role in ensuring that like people are interacting with each other and like communicating um Um, I, I think for the responsibility being shared thing, um, I guess this was just in reference to like a few particular instances where like we had someone who would like claim that they would do something and then because we like assumed, oh, you know, this, this because they claimed that they would do it, that it would get done. But I think like sometimes we let that, you know, we like got too complacent and then thought that it would actually, um, that that would actually get done anyways, but I, I feel like in the future maybe just like sending out a couple more emails, just like having people confirm that they finish things, like require that people send out emails confirming when they finish things, so we know that like, oh, this thing didn't get submitted yet. Oh shoot, class is in an hour or something like that. So um, just like encouraging people to either like poke each other more, and also to be more responsive about responsible about like when you submit something or when you do something important you like email out to everyone and uh, just to like show that you've done the work. Was email the primary means of communicating between the team or was there like face-to-face meetings outside of class or um, like So email was our primary means of communicating I think um, yeah we had uh, one face-to-face -face meeting outside of class and then there was another one that was supposed to be scheduled over a long weekend, but uh, like our uh, things happened, people were gone, like one or two people were gone for the weekend and then things fell apart, so. This is our game, Build a Spaceship. It looks like this. You have your ship with a set of component slots and a bunch of components that you can add to the ship. You click and drag them onto the ship, and then you send it out on a mission. After you go out on that mission, you'll get a log that looks like this. All this text is really small, so you can't see it, but it says things like, you met some bandits, you had a battle, you won and earned this much money, or you got hit by asteroids and lost this much health. And the point is that after you've designed your spaceship and sent it out on this mission, you'll get all this feedback telling you how your ship did so that you can then update your ship and send it out again and hopefully make even more money. The goal of the game is to complete uh, the series of missions that we have in the game currently and make as much money as you can while doing it. Of course, given more time, we would do things like add more components, upgrading your ship, and sort of other tweaks like that. But this is the core of the game right here. So what went right on our game? We made a prototype really early, which was great. Uh, 
that helped us all get on the same page and understand what we were talking about when we were talking about the game. Uh, there was a point before that where we had all these cool ideas from brainstorming and a vague idea, a personal idea really, of what the game would be. And that made it really difficult to communicate. Uh, so once we had that down, everything just become, became way easier. We did a lot of UI testing. Uh, even before we were sure of what the game would specifically be, we knew that it was going to involve adding components to a ship. And so we knew we could UI test that and see how people manage with different ways of adding those kind of components or customizing their ship. Hacks Flixel, we found it really simple to work with actually. And uh, whenever we needed to add, excuse me, add more screens or make changes to the game, uh, we all had a pretty intuitive understanding of how that would go. That might also be an artifact coming over from Phaser, which is uh, very similarly structured. And it, on our team, we kind of got lucky because everybody had coding experience. And it made it a lot easier because we were all speaking the same language. And so on a time-constrained project like this, it meant that when we talked, uh, we, we were more efficient about it. That's not to say that there isn't a place for people who don't have coding experience on these teams. It's just that when we only have two weeks to get things done, the speed uh, was a huge help. What went wrong was communicating our progress on the game. We had a lot of problems where you know, we wouldn't talk about what was getting done. We didn't know what was even in the game because some things weren't clear yet. Like there was one part where we didn't know that we could actually add components to the ship because somebody had added that in but not actually told us and the UI wasn't there yet to actually make it clear. We also ran into problems with heroic efforts where the night before something was due, somebody would like come in and put in all this effort and we didn't know what they were doing and we didn't know what was getting done because we just weren't communicating about that. A problem that's related to this is that we didn't assign tasks well or take ownership of what we were doing or you know, uh, assign responsibility between people. And so we ran into problems where things just wouldn't happen for long spurts of time. And then we'd run into the heroic effort problem at the end where we're all jumping in to make things happen. We also ran into problems where sometimes people didn't push commits for an entire day and we had no idea what the state of the game actually was. So what we learned from this and what we, were going to, what we would do differently next time is first we'd keep track of our progress and make sure that it's continuous. Uh, whether it's using Trello or emails or any other sort of solution for it, it would be really important to make sure we all know what the state of the game is and what's being worked on. We should come up with standards for how we're going to email and meet. We talked about this uh, and said it would be a good idea, but then we didn't actually do it. So it would be good to have a schedule of when your team is going to meet, uh, how they're going to email and why you're going to email, if it's a daily update of what you're doing or if it's every time you push a commit. And also coming up with standards for how you're going to use Git. Are you going to use feature branches and all these kind of things or are you going to do it all on master? And are you going to push every time you make a new commit or are we going to push you know, at a set time every day so that we can track it all at once? It'd be good to know who's doing what. That comes in with the idea of communication and tracking progress. What we did at first was we had specific domains that people were working on. Jeremy was working on the UI. Rodrigo was working on the ship model. And this made it really easy to assign tasks and to make sure that things were getting done in the beginning. But then in the end, when we had some tasks that were kind of in the middle and we didn't specifically say what was going to happen, uh, we ended up with this last minute scramble of, okay, I'll take this thing. Actually, I'll take this thing, somebody else coming in. And it made it a lot more difficult to track what was actually getting done. You can also give tasks to people. Uh, we were kind of reluctant to do that at first, but we got better at it and it was actually super helpful to just be like, hey, you take this and then it's completely clear what's happening. And the very last thing to do with this is to just ask what's happening. Uh, it's good to, to get some reassurance that something actually is happening if you're not hearing anything about it. So you can just ask someone like, hey, uh, what are you working on? Or hey, is anybody working on making this component appear? Then you just get an answer and you're, you get a lot of peace of mind from that. It's good to set up specific times to work together. We didn't do this enough, but it would have been great if we had. And like I said, we made a prototype pretty early on. 
but I think we could have made one even earlier. We found that it didn't limit our creativity or our ability to talk about the game. Instead, it just gave us a platform to work off of so we could sort of build a basic prototype with some idea of the core mechanic and then continue to brainstorm and expand from there. And uh, yeah, that's basically what we learned from this game and moving forward, we're looking forward to implementing this on project four. Any questions? Um, besides solving problems with Hackspace on your own, did you find any online resources that turned out to be helpful or did you just read everything on your own? The main problem that we ran into hacks with Hacks Flixel was we were trying to build an HTML5 and the text just wasn't working and we found nothing about it. We found one page by Hacks Flixel that said, sometimes you have problems with text, try doing this. That didn't work and nobody else had an answer for it. Um, I don't know yeah, if anybody else did. Um, basically, you have to read the Flixel documentation and ignore the Hacks Flixel documentation. Um, the APIs are identical, um, and the static typing does like save you a little bit. Um, and you have to jump into the source occasionally. Nothing around that. Anything else? Thank you. So uh, we did Looking for Dina. We have some screenshots of the game in case any of you didn't get to play it or see it. So it's just the third screen. We have um, the first thing, so the game's kind of in two, two like, uh, you have to do two different things. The first thing you do is you choose which planet you're going to go to, and you can't really read it, but they all have different distant stats as well as stat gains that each planet will give you. Then you have to navigate through an asteroid field, which depending on how far along are you are in the game, makes it harder as you go along. But hopefully you have those stat gains that should make it easier to actually go through it. Um, you're looking for Dina, and you can lose and win. So what happened, what was right and what was wrong, is we did communicate a lot. And by a lot, I mean like from midnight to like this class, there was 108 emails. And that was just today. So we communicated a lot, but we didn't communicate really effectively. There were a lot of people saying like, yeah, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, this is done, like I submitted this. But then going through those hundreds of emails trying to figure out, oh wait, who said they were doing this? Who said like this was submitted? Was really hard. And so we didn't have those like daily scrum meetings that we talked about and I'm realizing like, those would be really useful to have somebody say like, okay, this is what everybody's done. This is what everybody's going to do. This is what we've submitted. Having that like one thing somewhere where everyone can view it easily would make it a lot easier than trying to go through emails and figuring out who did what and like what went wrong. Uh, we also, one other thing we did right is we met in smaller groups. So people who were like working on the design met and just the, those people met and then people working on the code met just those people met which was really useful for trying to meet instead of like having seven people meet, you only had like three or four. And so it was much easier to arrange those meetings. We really divided the tasks effectively. Everybody was doing something. And like that's uh, kind of what the last point, everybody tried to make sure they were always doing something and contributing to the project. No one was just sitting there wondering like, what do I do? Everyone tried to constantly be doing something. Um, Another thing that went wrong is that we worked in bursts. So there was just, people were really busy and then like the night before we had signed an internal deadline, everyone was like, oh, okay, let's work on this right now. And so then it was just people staying up all night to try to finish something, which things got done, but like, you know, sometimes it's like, did we do this the best way we could? Was everything optimized? And didn't really, we weren't really sure because everything was done in these short bursts instead of like all, like a little bit every day. And if you guys want to talk about Unity. Yeah, uh, <laughs> as people have said, Unity is annoying because it has all these binary files that you cannot merge. So like two people are, we have to basically always keep track of, I am working on this scene, no one else touch it. Because if two people work on it, someone's going to lose everything in it, which is really annoying. Um, but yeah, emails worked for that. In the sense that that way you can say, I finished working with this scene, someone else can touch it now. So that was sort of helpful. Um, yeah. Metafiles are terrifying. 
So you don't know what they do, and maybe it just fits up like five of them. And you're like, I, I think it's fine. But sometimes a conflict happens, and you're like, I don't know what to do with this. I think I can just chuck all of them. But then things break, and you're sad. And like, I feel like that's even scarier than the scene. Because at least you tell each other, stop touching the thing or touching the thing. But sometimes you touch the thing, and then something else happens in part. And you're like, okay. I also want to point out like how impossible it is to schedule anything for seven people. Like, we wanted to meet on the weekend, and there was literally not a single period of time, not one hour that wasn't like at three or four in the morning where everyone was available. It was impossible. It was insane. Yeah, schedules are hard. I'm doing a video for the second level. Okay. Yeah, so I think that's it. Yeah, any questions? You, you, you had two points about deadlines that I was wondering if you... Uh, if no, so we did. So we did kind of keep the deadline. So what I was trying to say with that point is that we did kind of keep the deadlines where we worked in those bursts to get to the deadline. But then because it was such a like long burst by the end, everyone was like drained. And if it was like, I'll do this and like this other little small thing, a lot of little small things didn't get done. And so things were kind of pushed back a little bit. And so this led to more bursts and it was a really bad cycle that I think ended up happening. Um, oh. Do you think if you planned for the bursts, it would be better? I think, like if you actually scheduled meetings at 3 a.m. before. <laughs> 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 so I think it was more like, um, we needed more granularity in the deadline. So we'd say, let's get this bucket of things done by this day. And that, that would sort of, you know, People procrastinate. We have other work to do, and like, okay, well, I have to do this other dead, like this other deadline for this other class is due first, and leave everything for this until later, until we finish with every other class. So if you leave like smaller tasks more like spread out throughout the week, I think that would sort of enforce a more I'll work a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, as opposed to I'll work a whole ton two days from today, uh, which is what ended up happening. Yeah, we also didn't have a dedicated like scrum master or project manager who would like reinforce those deadlines and like, tell people to yeah, yell at them to get it done. Yeah, you just kind of would get an email like saying, you know, I have something to do at midnight. I'll start working at this after midnight. And so a lot of times that would happen and then things like got pushed back because that person didn't get that done. And so kind of have to wait. But everything got done. But everything got done. And it's very cute. I feel like that's what they're doing. <laughs> so yeah. So I think a big problem we had is we had just one enormous email thread, which became huge and monolithic and impossible to look through after a certain point. I think it would have been more helpful to break up into smaller email threads. So like people that were working on a specific feature in code, not everyone needs to receive all those emails. So it would have been, I think, really helpful for the future to maybe organize it in the sense that if me and Jenny are working on something, we email each other a lot, and at the end of the day, we send one email like, you know, here are the details that everyone needs to know. You don't need to receive like the 10,000 emails we sent before that. Uh, so at the same, keep everyone in the loop. Like, don't leave people out of loop, but sort of keep little pockets of communication so that everyone's not flooded with all this. And even having the designated Scrum Master, I think, would help with that a lot. Because then, you know, it's not even they're sending it out to like the group email thread. They're sending it to the Scrum Master and the Scrum Master, like, makes one thing. It would be really tiresome to do that every day though. So maybe like every other day or something. I'm not really sure how to like break that up because it seems like you'll just end up having a lot of things, like a lot of reports, like report this was done on this day, this was done on this day and like. Did, did you have any like sort of ways to track where what tasks were done and they come? We had like the Google had, Doc yeah, with like the change tasks. log. Yeah. That would, I think that was mostly done in like, so we'd say these are the set of tasks we want to finish like today or something. And then, I, for example, if I'm going to work on this, I send an email saying I'm going to work on this scene, no one touch it. Okay, I'm done working on the scene. And then once everyone finished working on all the scenes, then we go back and update the doc. That's what it does. It feel like we probably could have done some kind of weird joint thing where the sprint task list keeps track of like, 
big earth things, and then we have like some kind of chat email system going on, like make sure you stay in contact, especially with like all the unity madness. At the same time, it's a little bit like, hmm. So like what level of task size goes into the sprint task list? Because sometimes you can do something really small. It's like, yeah, this is what we spent the last two hours doing. What do we do now? Maybe kind of. But it's the, that's the like, chopping tasks up in the task bits. Yeah, that's part. But so ideally, you have those list of That's kind of what, that's what, if you can figure out a way to have something strong for you, whether it's, whether it's just a list you can hold off or people say, hey, you gotta finish this task, and some of that takes some task that's based on that. Or if you can go to using a big fancy troubleshooting or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to be talking about score high. This is actually our start screen. So just in case you don't remember what score high is, it was a game where you played as an MIT student. You went around to different buildings, did your homework assignments, ate, slept, and basically just tried to survive school. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about what went poorly. And the first thing we had an issue with was direction. So this time we didn't have a paper prototype. We had an idea that we wanted to do, but it ended up changing a lot right from the start. Um, and it became really difficult to stay on topic because we didn't really know what we were doing. And very much related to that, we then had issues with scope. Uh, we started off with a lot of unrelated features and a lot of components. And even now in our final game, it, there are a lot of components and the way they interact is complicated sometimes. Uh, and then finally, I think every single team has mentioned this, just planning ahead and getting work done earlier and planning time to work together. The issues we had, especially that came up later, were a lot of issues with midterms, things going wrong, Everything that could go wrong kind of went wrong. And if we had started earlier, we wouldn't have had, we would have been able to deal with those situations better. Okay. So based on that, what went well? Well, the great thing is that we did start right away just setting up everything we needed to work. We set up our email thread, our Google Drive folder, we decided on Unity first meeting, and we set up a GitHub project right away so that we could all collaborate. And the nice thing was, in our Google Drive folder, we put our task list. We really utilized that. And our email thread, like other teams said, it did get a little long and complex, but it was just so nice to have. And later on, we actually also got a group text messaging service. So that worked really well, dealing with that last minute hustle kind of stuff. Uh, the next thing that went really well is, I told you that our scope was way out there. We realized that very quickly, and we just started cutting, cutting, cutting. So we cut items, we cut AI interactive AI characters, we cut qu playable quizzes, we just cut everything that wasn't key, because our game, even without all of these things, already had a lot of components. Um, and then, once we had a playable game, the next thing we did was we really looked into feedback. So one of the main uh, feedbacks we got was our game was not visually cohesive. It did not make sense. The nice thing about score high was that because you're playing as an MIT student, you're just getting work done, people understood how to play and what they were supposed to do, but they didn't understand that. So if you look at the thing on the left, you're probably all just staring at it being like, what's that? Where the rectangles are buildings and the bottom's the stats bar and the right is the schedule. It's confusing. People didn't notice the stat bars or they thought they were buildings and things like that. So we responded to that right away. We said, we need to clarify this. We need to separate the status, separate the schedule, and make the map very clearly pretty and easy to get around. Uh, so that was one thing we responded to, and I think it went well. The next thing that we responded to feedback was we really listened to players, not only on big picture, but on smaller things. Players wanted a, they wanted WASD, so we put WASD. They wanted a clear way to leave buildings. They wanted to know what was going on when they were in a building. So we actually inserted a progress bar that says, what's going on in this building? How is it affecting you? And then to leave, instead of pressing space bar, which people found unintuitive, uh, they press a button that says leave. Much more intuitive. Okay. Now, given all that, we did make a really good game, but there are definitely some things we would change if we were to do it again. 
As I mentioned before, start with something simpler. Uh, we did not design the game around the scope of the project, and if we were to do this again, we definitely would. Uh, we tried to bite off more than we could chew. And related to that, minimize the number of components and understand how they will interact. Because especially if you're trying to break down tasks, people need to know what has to be conveyed between different components. Uh, plan for the worst. Midterms suck, people get sick or go out of town, and laptops break. These, literally all of these things happen to us. Um, we're still waiting to hear, is the laptop working? We don't know. Somebody's laptop broke last night. So, and they were working on something and finishing it up and suddenly all that work's gone. Uh, so, as I said, start earlier, plan for the worst, and just get things done. Uh, finally, it just, it worked out really well, and thanks for listening. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? No? Uh, unity. Yeah, Unity. Cool. I'm going to take that as no questions. Great, thank you. Beautiful. All right. Thank you so much, and actually a round of applause for everyone here. You actually did a really great job. Um, I think we're going to give you more detailed feedback um, in, a, in a few days, but I think one thing we heard definitely is, um, yeah, you're, by working in these large teams, you're coming across these issues that you don't necessarily, you still need tools. To, to, to come up to, to get over some of the, the, the management issues you're finding out, the communication issues you're, find, you're having, the scheduling issues you're having. Um, part of this is just experience. You just, that's kind of why we just throw you in the deep end, is just to figure out what are all the problems so that we can then talk about and have some common things to talk about how we're going to solve those things. Um, looking at the schedule, we'll probably end up moving a couple things earlier. Did you have a comment? Oh, I just wanted to make one comment. Um, it's possible your groups might be slightly larger for the next project. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, but what I want, but you, you've got a lot more time because you've got seven to eight weeks. And I, what I really want to encourage you guys to do is if you realize you're having communication and organization problems with your group, if you're not sure how to organize things or if it's not working, stop by the office and talk to us. I don't think we said this clearly enough in the previous projects, but we're not, yes, our goal is in fact to throw you out into the deep end, but we're not trying to throw you out in the deep end without, you know, at least a floaty to hold on to or a safety rope or something. Um, we are happy to sit down and talk with you, a small group, a small member of your group or your whole group, about how to come up with some individualized solutions um, to your team's communication and organizational problems, okay? Um, just, just a reminder, if you don't know where our office is, it's in the syllabus, it's in building 26 on the ground floor, you can see the, uh, our rooms all have the MIT Game Lab logo on it. And uh, yeah, what Rick was saying about tools, not all our tools are like mechanical tools. Not all our tools are like, you know, things that, 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 that you put in, in a spreadsheet. Um, the things like the meetings that we've been talking about, uh, where you're actually supposed to talk to each other, it's important to actually talk to each other during those meetings, for instance. Uh, of course, if you don't have an, uh, a, a way to be able to schedule those meetings because it's hard to get people together, you need to find a replacement to be able to have those opportunities to talk with each other. You can't just say, uh, well, we don't have time to do this thing, therefore we're not going to do it. Um, However, this being the final project, you're going to have a lot of flexibility to try out different ways to communicate with your team. So what worked in your previous projects um, should give you a good basis of what you can do in the future, but may not necessarily work with your future team because it might be different groups of people. And uh, learn from the previous pro uh, three pro projects about what worked, try it out. And if that doesn't work, try something different. You have time this time around, although still, Eight weeks goes by really, really, really fast. So don't overscope. Um, so we actually are running really short on time today. We've got a really long, um, uh, a lot of uh, content that Pablo's going to go over with us. So let's take a um, five minute break. Um, I'm actually going to skip the Project 4 introduction and I will put the slides up on Stellar and I will give that on Monday morning. Um, it's really just me saying out loud what all the Monday class. Don't take everything I say literally. <laughs> the spirit. Uh, Monday, Monday at one o'clock. Uh, so 
Um, the slides will be up. I'm really just going over what it actually says in the schedule by saying it out loud so you can hear it and see it. Um, but we'll do that on Monday. So take a break right now, and I'm going to get Pablo set up. You can see some folks, Pablo. I can in the distance, yes. Hello, everyone. <laughs> hey. So let me crank up the volume. All right, the room is yours. All right. Whoa, oh, loud. Well, <laughs> thank you again to all of you for still being there. Uh, thanks to the team in charge of the course for persevering with the invitation and the guidance on how to use this time. I'm sure you, or at least some of you, should remember the slide that I hope is on the screen. There's a comfort zone where people feel it's safe, and most often where people are safe, not enough happens. And uh, one of the things, one of the reasons why I hope we can work together is to see if we can create through games the magic circles that are slightly outside of the comfort zone of people, be it a Red Cross volunteer, a Red Cross staff, a person who is a scholar, a donor, a government official, to try to make something new happen. And that something new can be just understanding, it can be about dialogue, it can be about uh, perceptions, or it can be about some of the ingredients that eventually lead to action. So now let's see if this thing changes. Did you see a change in slide? Yes. yes. Good. So, um, let me move this thing. We're going to start by playing still. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to stand up. And Rick, can I ask you and someone to partner up with you to be in a place where I can see you? Okay. Uh, maybe Sarah or whoever you choose. Okay. Yep. Where are we in the camera? Hey, there we go. Everybody cool. The, there you go. Stand. So everybody find the partner to shake hands with your partner. Everybody has Okay. Oh no, it's cutting out. What you're going to do now is each one of the two in the two, in the duo is going to hold an imaginary deck of cards. Uh, oh, he, uh, he's, you've, you've dropped out. Oh, no. Uh, how's, how's our network? Uh -oh. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of network drops here. Yeah. OK, may I say just the following then? Uh, yes. If it is a matter of bandwidth, you can stop your video, and that should work. OK. Otherwise, we will do yeah. that. You'll be in charge of through audio, making sure that I know. Oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah, it dropped again. Mm. Well, you're still there and kind of fall. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. We can hear so you. So each one of you is going to hold an imaginary deck of cards. The cards are numbered 1 to 10. And I want you to shuffle these imaginary cards. I want you to take the top half of and swap it with your partner. Mm -hmm. And then you shuffle again those imaginary cards. So you should have a lot of imaginary cards number 1 to 10 in random order. If you're thinking, what does this have to do with Red Cross? We'll get there. <laughs> so now, this is crucial. Each one of you is going to take the top imaginary card make some body movement to reveal the moment when you're flipping it and simultaneously state the number that is on the top card. For example, uh, we can flip it and you illustrate. Yep. Right. Say your number at the same okay. Four. Six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> you don't have okay, that, ten fingers. Okay. Try again using body language to make sure it's simultaneous. Right? Okay. One, two, three, five. 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 All right. <laughs> so I couldn't hear the number, but first of all, you don't need to say one, two, three. You can use body language to make it happen right. simultaneously. Okay. It's two, 
clear advantage to make it as fast as possible. Okay. Two things can happen. If the two players say different numbers, there is no consequence, and you try again, the different number. Mm. The video is slowing the down. Same number, whichever you want, any. Okay, is the audio okay? Yeah, the audio is, is uh, cutting out and the video is pausing. Do you want to just switch back to the me controlling the slides and you on audio only? Sure. Okay, let's do that. Uh, I think he can just turn off his... See, if you uh, just go ahead and turn off your video and I'll make sure I have slides. Right, yes, let me get back to this. Uh, how do I do it? There. Cool, okay. so, so let me go back to this. audio now better? So far, yeah. Okay, good. So what I was going to say is that the two players are going to say numbers simultaneously. If the two numbers stated simultaneously are different, you keep going. You keep saying numbers at the same time. But if the two players say the same number at the same time, the first player to say snap takes all the imaginary cards and wins one imaginary point. <laughs> okay. You keep going, okay, and you start again. The purpose is in one minute or less to snap as much as you can. Those are the rules. Shuffle your cards. Ready, set, and go. You have less than a minute. Five, Five uh, six, two, ten, seven, eight, three, nine, twelve, two, one, six. Seven. Five, Eight, three, ten, four, four, four five, three, 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 three. <laughs> you get three, the point. One, five, six, two, six, two, seven, nine, seven, two, eight, 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 eight. Oh. Yeah, you get a point. All right. Nine, four, ten, three, four, eight, seven, six, two, three, one, four, one, five. 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 <laughs> oh, I think you got it. Okay. All right. Two, three, four, three, two, seven, eight. eight. Ah, okay, mm -hmm. you had two points. Okay, all right. Is that good? Okay. Good. Uh, five, five, two, seven, nine, eight, three, ten, three, six, three, two, two, <laughs> one, eight, nine, five, four, ten, three, four, two, five, five, six, five, seven, eight, two, nine, three, three, snap. Ah. <laughs> okay, all right. Four. I think I think you win. I think you just win this game. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, that's it. Are you talking? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> Shall I shut them up? Okay. All right. <laughs> Can we hear you? Uh, well, I was actually trying to be heard for the past 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do now. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. Good. What you're going to do now is to find we're going to play a second round with the two mile differences. The first mile difference, don't do it yet, but you have to shake hands with a different person. You'll find a new partner. Okay. The second difference is that instead of having numbers one to 10, you're going to have the names of animals. Each one of you should know more than 10 animals, so it shouldn't be a problem. Find your partner, shake hands, Someone else? shuffle your deck, so oh. and, uh, okay, you, you guys play. Oh. In 30 seconds or less. Somebody else, right? Yep. So we'll see somebody else. Yep. Hello, oh, I play with, with you, you play break. Go! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, animals, okay? Okay. Zebra. And. Aardvark. No, you just come up with one. Chicken. Cow. Dog. 
Pepper. Pink Pepper. Dog. Right. Snap. 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 <laughs> I got that one. All right. Um, All right. Wait, 30 seconds. Horse. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, uh, back to the spider. screen. Um, okay. Uh, eagle. Okay. All right, Pablo, you're back. Much harder. Yeah. Even though I am not in the room, can you hear me, guys? Good. Even though I am not in the room, I imagine that what usually happens may have happened again here. First of all, it seems much harder to snap. Second, more people find themselves going, ah, uh, I'm not saying an animal. There's like clogging of the brain cells. And then, very interestingly, very often, people don't listen to each other. So, for example, the first time I played, I was saying dog, cat, mouse. And my partner was saying zebra, giraffe, lion. And it took us a long time to notice that we were in different universes, that we were never going to snap. And then, interestingly, when you, when you finally say the same words, a lot of people don't snap. They, they, their brain cells did not get into that place. So we're going to play the last round. I want you to go back to your original partner. And in your deck of cards, you're not going to have numbers 1 to 10. You're not going to have animals. You're going to have words or concepts that you associate with the cross. Whatever you want. Okay. It has to be short. <laughs> Three words or less. <laughs> okay. So you, and of course you're trying to snap. So you have ten seconds each. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay, I shall. Oh. Okay. Um, I need to, to look at them. Okay. Sorry, because I need the clock. You want to try this? Okay. Uh, one. Yeah. Uh, health. Uh, more. Uh, bands. Uh, people. Okay. Oh, snap. <laughs> okay. Um, um, All right. Back to the screen. Okay. All right. Pablo. <laughs> All right. Back to you, Pablo. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> If what usually happens in this game happened in the room, first of all, it's even more difficult for people to come up with words. It's even more difficult to, to snap. And much more than before, people realize in the process of trying to play this game that they don't really know what they think about the subject matter being proposed in the third round of the game. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is very quick form groups of three. Don't don't start yet. Let me finish explaining. Form groups of three. Oh no. Your audio just cut out and the video just cut out. Are you back? I cannot hear you. Can you hear us now? Okay, now I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, the audio just cut out briefly, but you're back again. Okay, good. Now I'm back with audio. And you're back with audio. Um, I don't see the video, but I've got the slide up. Um, so so let, let me take the video up there. Um, so what we're going to do now, if you can hear me. Yes. Is to form groups of about three people, preferably three unless you really can. And, uh, and you're going to, as a trio, write four terms, four things that you could have wanted to write in that last step of part. Is it clear? So it's not about numbers, it's not about animals, it's about where they're constantly associated with the Red Cross. Form a trio and write four things that you hope to be in the deck of cards so you can write your stand. Go, you have to finish.
Everyone gets four cards. Actually, you could just use strap paper too. This is just in case you don't have any. Have enough cards? I I, I got a, I got another deck here. I need more cards. Yeah, there's this pile here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Extras? Everyone got. Everyone has four, right? Oh, in groups, groups of three. Yeah, I'll give you a few extra just in case you need. You make a mistake. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so I want you to give them no more than 30 seconds left. Okay. And let them know that time is running up. All right, 30 seconds left. And then Rick, what do you think is showing? The slide you, is showing, yeah. Sorry? The slide? Uh, no, not, uh, well, yeah. Actually, let, let's suspend. No, no slide yet. Okay. If you're just doing it. Okay. What I want you to do is to pick some trio, ask uh, the trio to choose one of the words or concepts that you have in the card, and invite all the other groups to say snap is they wrote that exact term. Okay. Did we get that? So one trio, come up and give one of your terms. Just stand up and so I go. So what's one of your terms? Disaster relief. Disaster relief. Snap. Yeah. Snap. How many? Snap. Snap. Three. Okay, so you have four or five. Trio. Okay, another, another one. Trio to say one of the words. All right, John. Red. Red. <laughs> Red. What was the word? Red. 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 All right. Okay, so do the same with two more trios, maybe three or four more trios. Okay. What's that? Blood donations. Snap, 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 snap. Okay. Another trio? Yeah. Aid. Snap, snap, snap. All right, another one? CPR. CPR? No CPR? Interesting. No snapping with that. Huh? Okay. Okay. So, there are two reasons why I wanted to do this. Thank you all very much. If we had the time, we'd play this game in a version that has winners and losers, where we would you know, eliminate the most at the least snapped, and the second most, second least snapped are the winners, for example. So you have to choose which of your cards to say. So. There are two reasons why I want to share this with you. One is to re-energize the room and bring it back into the game zone. And second one, give you a flavor of one of the games that I hope maybe some of you will consider playing. When we play this game in the context of a training worship, for example, we play at the very beginning, first with numbers, then with animals, and then with the subject matter, the course which can be climate change, can be humanitarian law, can be El Nino, can be shelter, can be urban risk. And people come up with words, and they write them down, and we keep those papers. And then, after training, which can be an hour or a day or a week, we play snapping. And we ask them to form different trios and to write the words that they would include in the game. And that collection allows us to compare the before and the after, and how the thinking changed. Rick, if you can show a slide that has the two word clouds. Yep, got that. So in that uh, word cloud, oops, let me uh, change this here. This is uh, from where we played about insurance. The one on the left was the before, and you see prompt and risk a premium accident disaster. When we played the game afterwards, there were more nuanced terms. There was community, there was collective, there was buffer, there was future, there was return, there was long term. And this was very useful for us to see how the thinking changed as a result of the session. So moving on to the next slide that says choices for your game project. These are the six choices that we want to make available to you. The zero one 
is uh, to create a digital version of a game that could be played uh, along the lines of what we just did, but for us to accelerate the collection of data so that everyone can see at the same time what just happened. I'll explain more later. Then in the list you see UNICEF GAN, and this is about pollen, a, a waterborne disease that is very tough. And uh, we invite two groups possible to take this one because it's an important one to us. And it's about helping school children in West Africa to manage health risks. The next one is about linking early warning forecast with early action decisions that can help save time. Since it is 75 in Boston and Cambridge today, uh, we thought it would be uh, relevant to say that we want to focus on heat waves. We could make it about hurricanes, we could make it about uh, volcanic eruptions, we could make it about many things, but we invite heat waves because there are a few reasons that make it useful. The next one is perhaps the most challenging one intellectually, it's about new funding mechanisms for disaster preparedness. I will explain this. We call it forecast-based financing, or FBF. And it's the, the one that has the most potential to transform the humanitarian world. The fourth one is about Ebola. As you can imagine, this is a very challenging time for my colleagues, and maybe some of you can give it a hand. And the last one involves adaptation to climate change. Uh, I think you may have met uh, uh, Jano, my partner in game design facilitation and life. She's leading a project for an organization called Plan International focus on work with children as well. So moving on to the next slide. Um, before we go into the details of each one of those potential topics, I wanted to share with you some thoughts about why digital games for these things. As you remember, hopefully, from the previous uh, visit of IT, the vast majority of our games have been non-digital. We play them face-to-face. -face. They have been very good for what they were intended to do, but they were reaching a very small group of people, only those who were there. Recently, we designed our first, we collaborated in the design of our first uh, digital game that was to be used in a MOOC. Uh, with the word "fan," and it reached 35,000 people, which I'm pretty sure is double the number of people that since the beginning of my work with games have been playing games that are not digital. There's clearly a lot of potential to reach to many, many people. And we're thinking of Red Cross staff, colleagues of mine who have a job as disaster managers, as a disaster response heritage experts, as you know, whatever it may be. There's also Red Cross volunteers, people who are not paid to do some work. It could be digital games. The people are basically people who make some decisions to save their lives or save others in the neighborhood. It could be about youth, school children, who maybe don't know something could learn uh, through games or have motivations that could inspire through digital games. And there's also the bigger picture, especially now in a time where uh, there's crowdfunding, there's uh, people who have the ability to act in massive numbers, many little things that make a big difference. A second is that games, including digital games, can do one ingredient of the many ingredients needed to support behavior change. We are not widely optimistic, and we believe that someone lives a life in a certain way, and then they play a game, and boom, they're a different person, and they change their behavior. Maybe that can happen, but we're aware that it takes more than a simple game to play, to, to change time. But we believe that games can help invite people to change behavior in a more memorable way. It can be about creating awareness, it can be about creating the desire, the want to learn more. It can be about awakening the interest, uh, the appetite. Or can be about inspiring people to take something they know or they already know and put it into motion, put it into action. <coughs> Importantly, because of increasingly, uh, sorry, um, Kelas Buddha uh, 
in there is so much growth in uh, digital technology in keep people who can program in people who have cell phones and so on in rural Africa and we see a lot of growth for growth within our team designing and deploying digital games particularly with UNICEF but also with many that involve self-organization of the crowd so uh, moving on uh, actually before I come to the next one uh, Rick would you like to either check anything or invite questions at this stage before moving to the details of each game? Uh, sure, so yeah, any questions about the target audience or the reasons for, for digital games before we move on? Yeah, one question? Um, will we be able to like, play test with our target audience? Or? So play testing with the target audience. Are any of these folks in the Boston area that we could invite in for a play test session? Uh, almost certainly not. Uh, so what we can do, is to play the games with people who are as close as we can get. So, you know, school children in Boston are different from school children in West Africa, but I bet that some commodity, there is a lot you can learn about your prototype for Ghana if you play with children in Cambridge or Dorchester. Uh, okay. Having said that, you may be able to get colleagues in developing countries to download your code and play it in Africa, in Latin America, or elsewhere. So I, I, I'm not even on the possibility for play tests with the target audience, but it is in the in nature of people's work to work for the benefit of developing countries. So we'll have to accept that there's going to be a limited ability to play tests, and that something that can happen in the early phases of uh, product design. Mm -hmm. Basically, we could do it if you had the budget for a plane ticket. And uh, it can be hard. Is there another question I saw? Yeah. Uh, are you envisioning this being used as a one-on-one -on -one thing, where one person is playing a game? Or are you envisioning this being used as sort of an alternative to a presentation, similar to the games that we've seen here? Yeah, there is a, it depends on the game. Uh, generally speaking, Mostly because of the likely limitations in your ability as students to design and deploy the games, we are seeking ideas that can be implemented for one player, one computer, one device, and that's a game computer. Yeah. Which can happen in the house, happen in the street, can happen waiting for the bus, or can happen and through the context of a workshop. But we decided not for multiplayer or more sophisticated endeavors. Yep. So yeah, when I when I talk about the uh, further about the constraints on Monday, um, I'll be mentioning that um, yeah, you could do a single player or a multiplayer game, but it'd be a single device, no networking. Um, and we are asking you to to think about the spectator experience. So what does it look like to be looking over the shoulder? What does it look like to be looking down on the table if it's an iPad game or a tablet game? Um, what, is it, what is it like if somebody's playing the game on a, on a screen like this? Um, consider one of those and design it, design it towards one of those. Yeah. So are school children, is this elementary, middle, or high school? And also, can you assume they speak English? So uh, for school children, is there a particular age range, um, elementary, middle, or high? And um, is there an English language um, assumption going on? Yes. So yes to English, uh, it will be countries where the official language is English and school children go to school and learn math and so on English. And different projects have different age ranges. But generally speaking, it's uh, 12 to 8. Uh, the ones that are about school children and others are not about school. So we get to that uh, the details of each game. Uh, so, move on. If you want to press the slide for the next one, yep. you know, um, thumbs up. Yeah. Um, those of you who were at the game session the previous time I visited may remember the game where you were all standing and there was a die and a six was a trophy. And if there was a six, you had to do the umbrella, uh, otherwise, you had to do the thumbs up. At the core, if you push again, you will see the little uh, sitting dude with long term movement and the running dude with the reaction. Yes. Those are the two basic is that we gently embed the You either do the usual or do something new. 
And what we want for the game is to continue to play the idea that you can make wrong decisions that will have negative consequences. But it's very hard to know whether the decision is the right one or the wrong one before the disaster has occurred. I imagine most of you in the process of designing games will digitally incarnate some core mechanic that bets that the player is going to say, do I do the usual thumbs up or do I start running with an umbrella? Uh, it will depend, of course, if it's a game about uh, uh, health, an umbrella won't be hit, right? It will be some other measure, but you get the point. It's about the preventive matter. The next slide, which I also showed the preview, uh, this is for what we want. We want players to experience an aha moment, a moment of this happy, that is the result of the process where they go through some, some not knowing what the best choice is. Otherwise, it will be too often to be equivalent to a PowerPoint. And I predict it would be boring. So, good luck to all of you coming up with the right balance between who and ah. So, moving to the next one. This is about the, the first for possible group from. It is in the context of the game that you just played. As mentioned, what we played with, we can very quickly connect all the cards for the groups of three. And we can quickly enter the computer, connect it to the internet, and produce a word cloud before and after. So people can see at the end of the workshop how their own thinking has changed. Now, when we went through the activity of uh, repointing to a tree of that tree, choosing a word like uh, blood donation and other people saying snap, if you have 50 people in the room, it becomes much more difficult because if you do it with everyone, it becomes boring. So what I invite you to consider is to create a digital tool that can be embedded or utilized or deployed to amplify the snap experience so that we can collect and process information about what people are thinking. So it will be face-to-face, -face, just like you are there. But I imagine digital interface, this could be made with 3,000 people in California. And then each three of enters words and then there's some game mechanic that gives an incentive and which is the experience that gives clarity of the time, that helps people visualize the result, and that helps us to collect and analyze the data, to assess people, to monitor, to evaluate, and eventually to support the dissemination of this particular concept. But folks, you have no idea how loud I was shouting at the first <laughs> round. Stop, and you were so energized. That's great. We love that. But we need to channel that so it becomes more useful uh, to the subject. So the chances of it breaks, if you deliver some uh, game prototype that works, it's near guaranteed that we will use it. If your tool helps us collect information in a somewhat playful way and share it and think about it, we're going to use it. And we're going to use it in five months starting day after you deliver. Uh, there are resources for this. There are uh, documents that can produce one for the World Bank of Data for Resilience Initiative. And you can also consult with me. I know should be near about some of the time if you have any questions about it. Rick, uh, do you prefer that keep cooking or do we give for or two questions on this one? Um, I think he, uh, he Is that a question? Him. I, I, I'm asking you if you prefer that we move on to the next oh, yeah. game idea, or if yeah. you, we pause and invite for questions. Um, yeah, wait, let's do questions after each idea, just really briefly. Um, so any questions about this game? Yeah. Yeah, so in this game, there is a little bit of networking going on. Um, if, you do, if you were to do this game, it would mean it's not a multiplayer networking experience, but you are you are transmitting data to some kind of server. So that's where this one gets hairy. Mm -hmm. This is, this is going to be, a, this would be 
It looks like a simple design, but it's actually a, a bigger, there's a bigger back, back end to this one. Yeah, this is possibly, just by looking at that full list, possibly technically the, 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 the most difficult one uh, because of the, uh, it looks like it's still a networking game, even though we are encouraging you to do single player, single, uh, single device. Yeah, so and designing for touch is very difficult too. So yeah. it just kind of, it gets big. Yeah. Any other um, questions? You, that, that, uh, that probably is a middle ground uh, that where, inst where you can think of, all right, what can be done with a single computer that would still make it easier for someone like Pablo to be able to run this in a workshop, for instance. Uh, you know, even just making his job slightly easier. Remember, we just played this game with imaginary things, right? Uh, you know, what can we do to, uh, that doesn't require the players to have a device? but speeds up the process from a sort of central computer, you know, to be able to say collect collective data. Um, I'd, I don't know what that will look like. That will be more of a design challenge rather than a technical challenge, uh, and, uh, but possibly more feasible for the size of this class. And it could not be that the, the, the results are shared in real time, but if people have a cell phone, they can just send an email with the words to some address, and then some back their face that looks that, and then someone punching buttons distills that. That is still my better than we now, which is to collect the pieces of paper, write them that ourselves, we don't understand the writing and so on. So, as was said before, any ideas that you may have to enrich the experience or to improve the collection and analysis of this one would be appreciated. If no group should this this one, no problem. Okay. All right, so let's move on. Actually, um, Pablo, can you turn off the screen sharing? Maybe that will speed up the... Oh, I wasn't aware that I wasn't sharing. Yeah, I just noticed it too. Huh, here it says that I am not sharing. Weird. Um, let me go to this. Uh, stop sharing screen. There we Good. go. Cool. Let's, yeah. So let's go to the next one. Next one is the important one. It's the UNICEF GATA. UNICEF is the most loved UN agency. <laughs> it, uh, well, I, I don't have evidence to back that statement. Generally speaking, it's one of the very well made UN agencies. It works with children and education, and uh, it does very good humanitarian work. And the team in Ghana has decided to reach out to the Climate Center. Originally, it was in the context of cholera, but they also have some money for uh, sorry, Ebola and cholera. And uh, they want us to design games for school children and to help them become familiar with an improved management of risks associated with health. I have no contract yet, but very likely that this relationship will grow and will grow in time and will grow in size and we'll be able to get into the digital very soon. So the context is that cholera, a, a waterborne disease, uh, is on the rise, in part because of population growth, in part because of urbanization, in part because of changing the character of flooding, access to water and so on. Almost a big and a big and a half risk of, a, of getting caught up in countries with disease pandemic. There are two to five million cases per year. And if you've never experienced it, I can assure you it leads to a very miserable experience. It's a very real disease. And uh, of course, it changes from one year to the next, but there's 100,000 people dying out of there are every year, and that's not good. And importantly, many of those tests are avoidable if certain measures are taken. Some of those measures are difficult. For example, providing clean water to them. That is not something you can do in five minutes. But other things are more uh, manageable. For example, how to deal with flooding and protection of water sources or basic hygiene and things, so many other simple things. So we have a money project, work with children in Ghana, uh, Rick and Tim have all details of the project uh, description. 
The purpose is to help reduce the risk of waterborne diseases, in particular in cholera. The chances of infest are very likely for this to be uh, something to be further developed. I would be very surprised between now and uh, December you can produce something which is ready to deploy to thousands and thousands of children. But if any of you come up with a full concept with a clean, clear, useful game mechanic, etc., then maybe it can become uh, you know, uh, direct stuff, your thesis, or or someone could be hired to to with money uh, to develop that effort. There is the other tool tips. Which if you click to show the next slide, you see uh, a screen capture. There is a chapter one introduction, the basics, and the situation, how to prevent it, how to coordinate, how to prepare, community aspects, all sorts of things. The toolkit by Unit 7 is extremely rich and detailed. And we are now conversing with them. Actually, within two days, we should be getting from them which are the key things that they need to learn, which is very important to practice. So, whoever ends up taking this challenge, and we hope it will be two groups, is going to be something that is very directly capable of saving lives. And that must feel good for whoever successfully takes on that challenge. Uh, I do not remember the age group, uh, but I'm pretty sure it was less than 18 and more than 10. But it may be more narrow than that. I don't remember. Ghana is an English-speaking country. It's a gem in Africa in terms of institutions and so on. The UNICEF team work, which is very, good, very strong, very dedicated, and very interesting. I'm going to pause here and invite for the questions. Any questions about this one? Okay, no questions on this one. Very good. It was either very boring or very clear. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, if you have in uh, screen. Uh, Slideshow, you can see all the text. Yep. Good. Um, so, this is about linking early warning with early action. Science can be a forecast of something that's likely to happen in the foreseeable future. And there are timescales that can be at the seasonal level, like El Nino and you know, weeks to months. We're more likely to focus on the hours to death uh, lead time. In the case of hurricanes, that's very useful, but there's a lot being done. In the case of heat waves, that's not very much lower. And the issue with heat waves is, on one hand, because of global warming and, and the changing climate, the risk of heat waves is very steep in the price. Uh, you may remember from uh, almost about a decade ago, Netherlands, France, Belgium, they had tens of thousands of people die because of the heat. And most of those people die for very, very avoidable reasons. So if you're elderly, with respiratory problems, you have certain health conditions, very simple things like being in a colder room uh, with your conditioning or drinking more than you want, that alone can be in a construction workers or sports collapse. You know, all you need to do is to suspend the competition or to give a uh, track work to the peak at the peak uh, midday hours. So it's very easy to see if it's not clear in some cases, and it consistently gets people by surprise. So the purpose of this game will be to support Red Cross Network, especially for long as at the neighborhood level, so they can learn what are the simple actions that can be taken to save lives, not only own, but more importantly, the lives of vulnerable members of the community. The chances of increase, I think, are also pretty clear, but in a little bit more of a, uh, a timeline. So it will be that we start looking in January. It will need some publish because there are some um, institutional needs to embed. Once the game exists, it has to go through Red Cross channels, which can be more complicated than doing it through school children, where if it's picked up, it goes viral quickly. But it's it's still a very good one. Again, it's one that can lead to saving real lives. 
and there are plenty of resources uh, within the Red Cross and beyond. Very importantly, there's a master's student at Harvard who's doing her entire thesis on this, and we're going to have at least one, maybe two hackathons uh, dealing with heat wave risk. Um, the Harvard student, her name is Elle, she's really great fun, and she would be a, a collaborator, and this, this will uh, have a lot of chances of growth. Um, if you click, you will see a photo from the Netherlands heat wave, uh, a Red Cross volunteer helping an elderly lady just hydrate, and that lady did not die, whereas tens of thousands did. Uh, can you come up with a game that helps people take such simple decisions? And I'm sure there is a way to make it fun. So, over to you. One or two questions? Any questions on this one? So the target audience on this one's different. It's, um, it's Red Cross volunteers and staffers part of, probably as part of their training? Correct. Okay. So the way we envision this, actually you didn't mention, the way we envision this one is to have the game as readily deployable, but off the shelf, and then when there's a forecast of a heat wave likely to happen over the coming six days, then we, we blast the game to the Red Cross volunteers so that they, they become very quickly familiar with the very core aspect of it. Of course, complemented with other things like maybe face-to-face -face training or maybe sending documents to read. But this would be uh, potentially very easy to adapt or translate to many languages. Uh, and again, Chicago, Boston, there's plenty of places even in the US. This is the one that would be easiest to play test locally because we can, uh, and you know, the profile of a Red Cross volunteer is not necessarily too different from the profile of uh, university students who are engaged in, uh, in, in do good activities. Okay, go on to the next one. All right, moving to the next one. The next one is the most complex. <laughs> um, do you see the drawing of the time bomb with the fuse? Yes. Okay. So, allow me to give a little bit of context. We did a little bit of this conversation when I showed up a, a few weeks ago, but I imagine you all forgot by now. The humanitarian sector has two main funding mechanisms. Imagine a pot of money. Even if there's almost no money there. If the pot exists, money can go in to then be taken out to spend. One of the pots of money that exists, one of the funding mechanisms that exists, is for disaster response. Meaning, a hurricane, a flood, a volcanic eruption, something has already happened, is happening, and is killing people. People are dying, but if you did something, you could save lives. For example, get on a boat and rescue people who are stranded on a roof. Or people are sick, go give them medicine. This is disaster response. And if you spend money, you can do very good things. And the funding mechanism exists. There is another pot of money, which is for a normal day. The Red Cross has vehicles. The vehicles need maintenance. They need to change tires. You need to uh, buy a new computer. You need to pay rent and uh, electricity bills. You need to train staff. So on a normal day, you have a budget for you know, either maintenance or development of new projects or writing proposals and so on. And that pot of money exists, we call it the annual appeal. Every year we appeal for help. And uh, people or donors or governments give us some money. What does not exist is what the drawing, the cartoon depicts, which is when there is a signal from science that a disaster, that something bad is likely to happen soon. We don't have money to fund action before the disaster, after the forecast. So if you click to see the text, the context is that there's that missing money pot. We have money for after the disaster, we have money for the normal day, but we don't have money for before the disaster, after the forecast. The issue is that if you spend money in that time window, before the disaster, after science says the disaster is likely, you can do very good things for very cheap 
and, and relatively simply and much more reliably. It's not only more expensive but more difficult to save a life when the, when the storm waters are flushing through a city and people are about to drown. The boat is unstable. Whereas if you do it the day before, when the water has come down from the sky but it's still in the river and not in the city, people can take action by just walking away on their own means, with their valuables, and not just depending on someone to show up with the boat. So we came up with a financial mechanism, we call it forecast-based financing for disaster preparedness, which is nuanced in how it's implemented. There's a pot of money, it's like a bank account. You need to have a threshold of disaster risk that needs to be exceeded. So it cannot be two drops of rain, it has to be a lot of rain. It cannot be some grid, it has to be a hurricane category one or more. But once the threshold is established and reached by the forecast, then there's some standard operating procedures, some actions that people have to take, spending money to save lives. And that is something that if you could come up with a game that captures that, this is the one that if we help communicate forecast-based financing I said to the public, because it can work for a broad audience digitally, ideally we would reach those who can contribute either money or decisions, muscle power. Uh, the chances of embrace for this one are not as high as all the previous ones, but if it were to happen, it would have the highest impact, because right now there's billions of dollars being spent in the two extremes, and if a small fraction were spent investing in that precious window of opportunity, when you see the fuse getting close, that time of effort can really have a very, very high impact. There is a link to a journal article that is, should be very clear for MIT students. Uh, we also have some simpler readings, and Jan and I have been engaged with it and are ready to help. This is, I insist, the one that is intellectually most challenging, but I think if you nail it, it will also be the most rewarding. Questions? Any questions on this one? So one thing, when, when we first started um, designing this class, this was actually our, the, the problem that we were most interested in, um, mainly because the other problems we just didn't, hadn't heard about since. Um, the cholera, cholera was a recent um, yes. uh, proposal that was asked for, and Ebola, of course, um, very, very recent as well. Um, so if you really enjoyed some of the challenges from projects two and three, and you really took on the, the planning aspects, the trade-offs as aspects of those two games, um, if you're looking at kind of trying to, trying to communicate to another person how these kind of probabilities works, uh, this is probably a really good project you might be interested in. And I should say also that working with a few MIT teams, including the Humanitarian Response Lab, including the Environmental Engineering, uh, we have uh, two generations of three students plus one professor go to Uganda to work on, on making this happen for real. We got German money to do it uh, in Togo and in Uganda. So it's beginning to happen, but it's hard to explain because it's dry. It's like explaining insurance. You know, people get bored before they get it. So maybe a game can help uh, motivate. Good, then we move on. Number four, Ebola. Uh, I have to be very candid. I come from climate research, climate and disasters, and as far as we know, Ebola does not have much of a climate signal, but as, as I'm sure you know, it's a very important thing, and the idea for bringing this up is that one of my dear colleagues, Stephen Ryan, uh, one day sent a message saying, tonight I'm arriving in Liberia to work for a month with a Red Cross national team that is doing its best to respond to the Ebola outbreak. And guess what? What they're doing as it's best is not enough. Uh, Stephen is a communications specialist. Uh, as you can imagine, I feel phenomenal admiration and uh, respect for his dangerous choice to go to the place where people are in very serious trouble to try to help. And that made me think, well, maybe we can help. So I sent him an email. And he kindly responded, saying yes, they're keen on the possibility of a game. Bear in mind that because of the cycle of the disease, by December, chances are that either it became you know, a complete pandemic or, or the way it is completely gone. So we are not going to make a game to be played 
in an equivalent situation as the situation now. It would be more of a game about uh, awareness of how it works and, and, and how it can be prevented in a hopefully less than complete crisis mode. But nonetheless, uh, Stephen and, and one of his colleagues were very grateful to offer themselves to be the subject matter experts uh, to help should a team choose Ebola, please no more than one team. Uh, you know, there's someone on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean that is uh, going to try to engage. In this one, Jean and I do not have expertise. I imagine it is possible to find expertise in the Boston area with so many phenomenal hospitals and so on, but it's uh, outside of my control to offer uh, reliable support when it comes to subject matter. I'm sure that there's plenty of documents from the CDC and from health practitioners that can help you design the game, but whoever chooses this, it will be heroic. It can be really useful, but you have to be most prepared to work autonomously. Any questions? Maybe. Oops, mutes. Are you guys there? Nope, sorry, I had the microphone muted. Um, yep, no questions on this one. All right. So moving on on the last one. Uh, if Jano hasn't joined yet, then I'll do my best to explain. Yep, I uh, haven't seen her yet. So this is a project that is being led by two of my colleagues, including Jano. So forgive my ignorance. Uh, it's fairly similar in its nature to the UNICEF one. Uh, the difference is that the UNICEF project is for school children about a very specific health condition called cholera, whereas this one is for a partner called Plan International. It's a, an NGO that works with children. They're very good. Uh, they, they work a lot on the rights of children. They are about empowerment and, and they, they work intelligently. And uh, the Asia team has reached out to the Climate Center. Uh, I don't know if you can read the words, but in summary, they want a game to help children in Asia understand climate change and what can be done to adapt to climate change. Uh, Plan International seeks to partner with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center to develop a participatory learning game for children in Asia, focused on Southeast Asia, so all the way from Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, etc., that will strengthen their understanding of local climate change impacts and help them develop ideas on what they and their community can do to adapt and increase their resilience. The project will include the development of a game package, testing, and a training of facilitators. The current project does not include a digital component because there wasn't enough money. But like the UNICEF one, this is an area that inevitably has to grow. So if any of you comes up with a, with a prototype that is sufficiently playable to capture something about climate change, there's generally two core ideas that children can benefit from learning. One is that the trends of change are dangerous. Trends like sea level rise, like drying of some sources of drinking water, as well as the changing pattern of extreme events, which can be about rainfall, can be about temperature, can be about winds and cyclones. And so children who have not lived long and therefore don't have much of a memory are likely to have to confront information about things, uh, extreme events, disasters that they've never experienced, but, but they have to do something about. So uh, the game is not about one specific threat, but it's more about the concept of adaptation to climate change, which of course can be embedded into a, a, a specific manifestation of climate change, like sea level rise or like uh, changing rainfall patterns. Um, there was a more clearly defined age group for this one, which unfortunately I don't have off the top of my head, but uh, Jean will be sending the materials to the team, so within 24 hours I pray you will have all the ingredients you need. Uh, I know I didn't share too much, but are there any questions about what I could share? So any questions about this one? Nope, no questions on this one. Okay, so then move on to the next slide. Uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes left if we want. And uh, this one is about questions 
comments. I'd like to get a flame from the room. You have all choices here. The first one was Snap, adding a digital tool to enhance the Snap experience of collecting and processing information. Then we have the UNICEF Ghana, Cholera, where I really hope we can get to because this is the big one. Then we have linking early warning with early actions, maybe focusing on heat waves. Then we have the more sophisticated conceptually, uh, endeavor of forecast-based financing, funding mechanisms for disaster preparedness before the disaster after the forecast. Then we have Ebola, where there's not much I can offer other than if you make a game, we can try to hook you up with people, and if, if you come up with a good game, it can be really useful. And the final one is adaptation to climate change to be played by children in Southeast Asia so that they understand climate change. Here's what I propose. We're going to give you guys 30 seconds. Each one of you choose one or two secretly based on what you heard today, which is completely incomplete information. But that's the way it is. Given what you heard, Choose one or two of those in the coming 10-15 seconds. I'll give you that time. Thanks, Rick, for your patience. Not a problem. And so, what we're going to do now is I'm going, you're all sitting, I imagine. Actually, Rick, can you yeah. show the, the, the room? Yep, let me go back to Skype and turn on our video. Do -do Okay. All right. So what I want to do is I say the number, and if that number is of your chosen one, I want you to do two things. One is to stand up, and the other is to shout snap. Because <laughs> I cannot see everyone, I cannot hear everyone, but they will give me a place of fortune. So I can zero if you're ready to stop stand up and talk. Yeah. All right, so we've got maybe one in four less. Excellent, next time. Number one, if it's of your liking, do it. Snap. All right. Good. This one, make all of you guys stand in the room because I don't see enough in two groups. Maybe they're making them. The next one, number two, if you're going to do it, do it. Oh, what's going on? All right, this one seems popular. All right. Number three. Go. All right. Thank you. Number four. Show it. Four, four was the funding one. Yes. OK. Let me see. Yep, you're right. I'm wrong. Four. Yeah, we're talking counting from zero. Four is Ebola. All right. So yeah, nobody stood up for this one. Okay. And uh, it thanks for your honest science. <laughs> going to the last one, number five. Go for it. Okay. Okay. So what I propose then, I don't know, uh, Rick and T, what you had in mind for this time, but given that we went relatively fast. What we could do is you could point to different places of the room. You know, the top left of the stairs is zero, middle left is one, and so on. And invite people to just answer with their feet, which is the location that they most want to go to. So we get a sense of how many people want to engage in which game. OK, so we've got it on the board. Um, cholera here, Ebola here, early warning here, and these are, these are actually uh, behind you, so I'm going to have to rotate the computer sure. around. Uh, snap over there, adaptation here, and disaster prep funding, the forecast-based funding over here. Let's draw out the numbers as well. Um, so oh yeah, I'll put the numbers snap up. Snap was zero, mm -hmm. cholera was one, um, early warning was uh, two, uh, funding was three, uh, Ebola was four, and adaptation to climate change, five. Yeah. So answer with your feet. You cannot stay sitting where you were. Uh, 
And now, Rickon team, I'm going to invite you, because you know best what is required for each group, be a balanced group in terms of quantity of people, in terms of profile, you know, the long oh, yeah. code geeks in one and the narrative geeks on the other. So, yeah. uh, if you want to spend this, uh, this uh, what happens now is no, in no way definitive, but it's to get a sense play from what happens in the room. Yeah, so actually, this, this leads re really well into what we're about to do, is we're going to do some brainstorming on these topics. Um, so we're going to first have each of the groups um, just do a little bit of, of quick brainstorming about the topic that they're standing with right now. Um, and then midway through, we're going to invite you to go over to a new group to talk about a different project if you're interested in talking about that other project. Um, on Monday, we're going to actually form the teams and make sure all the teams meet our requirements, um, but are basically uh, seven to eight people per team. Um, we're hoping for eight people per team. Um, hopefully not more than that. We'll figure that out as we go. Um, and over the weekend, uh, we'll um, be using the, email, the mailing list to, to talk about the projects. Um, so I'm actually going to let, um, we're going to start off with this uh, brainstorming. We're going to take a break. We're going to do some more brainstorming. And then I will more clearly outline how the, the mechanism is going to work between now and when, Monday. Do you need me to stay online? Um, no. Uh, what we would like is um, if I can, are you going to be on email um, between now and Monday? Uh, yes, but only with very limited ability to read and respond. So make sure to make the subject line very clear and the questions as uh, snappy answer as possible. Great. And you don't mind if I, I give all the teams your email address? Uh, no mind, but teams, please, 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 I beg you, uh, consolidate your questions. Be very efficient with your right, because if I get too many emails are too wordy, excessive verbosity, I will not be able to get. Okay, so yeah, I'll so figure out a mechanism to, to define, uh, you know, a channel within each uh, group to communicate and consolidate. Okay, so yeah, I'll figure out a mechanism to make sure you're not overloaded with email and to make sure everyone gets the the benefits of those emails to you. Good, and I suggest that. Uh, uh, always copy recourse to one thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So back to you all. Thanks again for your time and inspiration. And thank you. Good luck next time. Okay. Thank you, Pablo. Yay. Cheers. Okay. So you are in your, your groups. I have paper for people who are not on chalkboards. Do we have nobody for Ebola? No one. Okay, then let's give Snap the Ebola. Actually, you're pretty big. Let's not. Yeah, these two, two, two groups are pretty big. Let's give them space to spread out. All right, so um, what we're going to do is just do a really quick brainstorm. Five minutes. Just um, choose one person to be the secretary. Have them come up. Um, you've heard a little bit about the topics. You haven't done any of the reading yet. We're going to have all that reading available for you on Stellar right now for you to read over the weekend. Um, it's a lot of it. We don't expect you to read all of it but we do expect you to look at it. Um, based on what you understand, what kind of mechanics could come out of, out of these kind of topics? Um, just based on the word cholera, based on the word early warning, early action, what kind of game mechanics pop out of that? And just throw them on the board. Uh, so disaster prep, let's give, let me hand these off to those two. Then to disaster prep, or to, to more than one group, or just one all to one, one and one to the other, yeah. Okay, we had a question back there, by the way. Rick, we have yeah, a question second. at the back. Yeah. Um, what's the question? From whom? Yeah. Let's stick it up on the wall. Yeah, what's up? All at the back. You guys probably need the stand. Um, same as previous ones. We'll talk about the constraints on Monday. Don't worry about the constraints right now. Right now, just focus on game mechanics. <laughs> Ask, yeah, mo yeah, so keep it blue sky. You can be mobile. You can be on tablets. You can be a computer. Um, it could be single player. It can be multiplayer. It just don't do multiplayer networking. That's it. What's up? Then what are the ways you're going to get around that like we talked about? Without, well, without doing, um, without doing multiple devices connecting to a single server. Um, there's other ways. To, don't even think about it for this brainstorming. Just don't worry about it for now. Here you go. Pass these out. All right, so five minutes, go.
Oh, some. Just in case my wife sends. <laughs> Final version. Yeah. They have the project managers do all the, the their own project managers. Yeah, oh. they do all the. Um, we've done about 15 minutes of really quick and dirty brainstorming. Um, somebody from your group, shout out one or two really really interesting ideas that you're really excited about. Just one person, one group, interesting ideas. This group go. So spatial placement of wells affecting where cholera spreads? Yeah, OK. So a spatial puzzle kind of game? Exactly. One more idea? Uh, Animal Crossing with cholera and puzzles. Yes, <laughs> Animal Crossing. I think about the scope on that one. Yeah, playing as the heat wave. Well, playing as the heat wave. Yeah. You are the heat wave. Cool. One other idea? Um, playing as a Red Cross volunteer managing resources. OK. Not as cool. <laughs> heat wave <laughs> Resource volunteer. Uh, over here. Wah, wah, climate change. Cool. Thank you. Another idea? Or is that the big one? Um, uh, the decision between chopping forests and to build more buildings for faster development or to keep the forest there to help uh, make climate change uh, less Cool. Severe. So one's kind of you don't have much action. The, the world is going around you. This one is kind of you have action. The decisions you make are going to affect things. Cool. This group here. This was SNAP, right? This group? One or two ideas? Oh, well, so I was thinking about kind of like not just choosing words, but given a scenario, like making a particular decision comparing it to decisions other people made given that exact same set of inputs. OK, so really thinking about how you're going to make this kind of this simple decision or the simple interaction that the game has make it a little bit more complex and really kind of bring the decision making out in the forefront. Is that kind of what it sounds like? All right, cool. Yeah, what's up? Um, the way I understood the game as, as, for, as a description, description for Snap was that uh, it's more of a data collection method, like collecting what people. That's at least the purpose they want, is they want that data. They want, well, they want to collect that data, but they also want to reflect that data back. So it's a little bit of a visualization. It's actually a lot of a visualization, as much as it is collection. Cool. Are those the only groups, or the only concepts? Oh yeah, disaster preparedness. Everybody just dis disappeared. Uh, anybody from that group want to run over to the sheet and say uh, an idea or two? Or are you just kind of, no, yeah. I think we, we just got stuck on the brainstorming because the problem is not like, as easy. So it's hard. Yeah. That's going to be a hard one. All right. I think like, one idea we came up with mind. is like, bil like building an infrastructure. And do, like, you would decide whether to like, keep expanding or to like, reinforce the structure. and like. And that way you would manage, like, oh, are you preparing for like, before the disaster or after the disaster? Um, do you have something to add? I was just going to say we, we felt like we needed to do more reading to yeah. understand yeah. exactly what they're talking about. But something about there, are, there is something that can be built to, to, to spend that money on. So it's not just about collecting the money. It's that money's going to go somewhere, um, which I remember him saying at least, I don't know if it was a meeting with me or if it was one, one of the first times he, he came to class to talk, but I remember that came up. OK, um, take a quick couple minutes, one person from each group. Make a copy of all the ideas you have on the board somehow, like a photograph or actually just take a photograph of it and then come back down to your seats. Got two more slides, then we're going to release you.
All right. So after you've taken your shot, your captures, sit down. All right. So what next? I'm going to stand in front because I don't, can't see what my slides say. Um, so today we brainstormed on the group on, in groups on these topics. Um, between now and Monday, what we'd like you to do is use the mail mailing list, the video games at MIT.edu mailing list, to form teams. Um, on class, in class on Monday, we will actually also set aside time in the beginning of class to make sure that all these teams get formed. And we're going to do some more brainstorming and some more pitching on Monday. And I'll go into more detail about the requirements for the Project 4. But make sure you read the Project 4 assignment. That's basically all I'm going to be doing is just saying out loud what it says in there. Um, so before next class, do these things. So read the material in Stellar. All the topics have some material in Stellar. Um, the Ebola topic did not. The SNAP topic did not. But Cholera has the toolkit that he, that he mentioned up there. Um, early warning, early action has um, a, it's got a, like a task force guideline, like an a idea of like world disasters from 2009, I think, and then a, another journal article. Um, the disaster prep funding has that forecast-based forecast -based funding journal article um, attached to it. Um, adaptation for, uh, to climate change, we don't have the materials yet for that, but that should be coming in today. Um, and uh, that'll be put up into Stellar. Um, that's all of that, right? Okay. So um, when you were in your groups, think about these, these questions and think about these questions until Monday. Did you have, actually have eight people interested in your topic um, when you were in your group together? Like, thinking, like think back about the brainstorming. Did you see eight eight, seven other individuals interested in the topic? If you did, you could probably make a game based on that topic. If you didn't, it's going to be difficult to find people uh, for your team. So really use the mailing list and try to um, figure out ways to use the mailing list to try to attract people to your topic. If there's something about like the game design that you came up with, um, a, re a personal reason why you'd like to see this game get made, throw it to the mailing list. Um, if you really don't care about the topic so much or any of these topics, but you really want to do programming, you really want to do art, you really want to do code, whatever you want to do, if that's the thing that you're most interested in, that game engine you want to use, um, throw an email to the class to say, hey, use me. Here's what I'm interested in doing. Just put me on, like, bring, like, put me on your team, basically. Um, if you're more interested in mechanic design over the topic, that's also OK. So you might not be interested in the topic, but you're interested in some of these mechanics that, we're, that we've been um, talking about in class, or some of the mechanics that you, that you heard mentioned in the, um, in the group brainstorm. So mention that in the mailing list. Um, again, team formation will be finalized on Monday. And if you are undecided, I'm just going to stick you in a team. Um, that's the worst thing that can happen. Because if I just put you in a team, I'm not thinking about who you're going to work best with. I'm not thinking about what game engine you're working on. I'm not thinking about the, whether or not you're interested in the topic or not. I'm just grabbing you and sticking you on a team. So do all the work for me so I don't have to do that. And if you do just want me to do that, that's OK. <coughs> I like rolling dice. Um, do we have any questions about this, any concerns about this? Yes? So are you targeting five teams? Um, no, I'm targeting teams of eight. So. That's, that's five teams, but it could be four teams if we, if, if we need more people on the teams. Um, I would recommend 10 being your biggest cap. Um, in the past, so in the past, 10, we have seen 10-person teams work-ish. Um, they failed everywhere you think they failed, communication largely, um, scheduling largely. Um, the one thing they didn't have that I think you're more prepared to do if you were in a big team like that is they didn't understand how to break out into strike groups, into strike teams, how to separate tasks and, and form into smaller groups. I've actually seen you all do this on these, other, on these on previous two projects. So if you, are, if you do find yourself in a large team, think about how you're going to break the work up into these small tasks, um, into these, well, into these like bigger modular kind of things. Um, especially think about why you're in this class, what did you expect to get out of this class, what do you expect to get out of this final project. Um, if you wanted to do some really big tech thing, there are some ideas out here that require some, some, some heavy tech lifting. If you're interested in design, there are some really, really challenging design issues, especially with that, for, uh, that um, forecast-based um, funding. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really leaving that up to you, but I'm going to make sure that all the teams have eight people. Um, any other questions? Okay. Just one statement. Like, um, 
especially with the SNAP team, I do realize that as presented to, to, to you today, it really does seem like a networking game. It, that really does seem like a game that will involve a lot of networking. And of course, we've spent the entire semester so far telling you, oh, good Lord, don't do that. Um, so uh, it, is, it could be a huge tech challenge, or it could be a huge design challenge. The huge design challenge is how do you accomplish everything that we think we need networking to accomplish without net networking. Uh, or it could be a tech challenge that's, screw it, we're going to do networking. You know, um, and then becomes, what's the, the least brittle way to accomplish that? The problem with networking in that particular game is that what, if uh, to require networking means that you need to play this game with net, uh, in a room with networking, uh, which means if you take it to a room without Wi-Fi, for instance, you know, that means it's got to be something that's going to work over a phone system or it's going to you know, require short messages or something, something ridiculous, right? Um, and then if you don't have networking, it's like, what are you going to be doing? Are you going like, to point a camera at the room and do image capture or something? It's like some crazy things. Are you going to do manual data, in, uh, manual data entry? That's actually a possibility. Anything that you can come up with that makes that game that we played in class slightly easier might be you know, beneficial for Pablo. And, uh, and he's guaranteed that he will use it as soon as, 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 as you pro provide it. So that's an incentive right there. But it is possibly, despite how simple that game is, possibly one of the toughest design challenges that I can see on the board today. Um, up until now, we've been really strict in allowing you to use specific tools, to use specific methods. We're going to start easing up. But if you break any of the rules, you need to tell us why. That's all we ask. Uh, if you are going to use multiplayer, tell us why. If you're not going to use one of these game engines that we've been practicing on for, the, for this semester, really, you really need to convince us. Um, so use the office hours like Sarah suggested. Um, use the mailing list. Talk to us during class. I've already had um, quite a few students um, talk to me individually and talk to them individually about these kind of things. So the rules are there to be broken, but, you know, yeah. Don't break all of them at once. Break yeah. one. If you're going to like get rid of like the tasks list or something like that, what what are you replacing it with, yeah. right? You know, uh, tell us. Uh, and uh, if you're going to be not doing daily scrums because it doesn't work for your team, what are you replacing that communication strategy with? Because it's clearly there for a particular reason. Hopefully, you've seen the reason, uh, even if you you haven't necessarily managed to make it work on a previous team. So, what are you going to do in its place? Sarah, do you, did you want to? I think you guys covered it all. Hmm. Uh, about all I can do is restate, is restate the comment about breaking rules. And it's break rules with care. Um, we didn't give them to you just to be arbitrary. We gave them to you in our experience of watching a lot of students make a lot of games and make a lot of mistakes that these are the big pits that people dig themselves in and then climb down and wonder what the heck they're doing in. So if you're going to break a rule, have a plan for it. Come and talk to us about whether or not you think your plan will work. Um, we, we are here to try and support and give you advice and help out. And I think it's fair to say that we've seen every single rule that we've provided actually successfully broken yep. in every single year. Uh, you know, not, not, not all the time. Except for that bad year. year. The what? Except for that bad year. Except for the one bad year where every project was crap. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't be that year. <laughs> No, you're not that year. Yet. You're not that year. No. And Polina was in the class last year, so if you're if you're looking for, um, you know, student level, what was it like in, during this project? Talk to Polina. She can help you out. She can give you some tips. And talk to each other. That's why we do all these presentations. Yes. We're going to talk about that um, through the through the rest of the semester. What does polish mean? Um, polish to our eyes. I'll, I'll talk about this on Monday. But basically, what we're asking for is. The games you've made these past two projects, that's about the scope you should, you should um, think for project four. So if you're thinking about that kind of scope, but then you have four times the time, what are you applying that time towards? Um, polish in making sure the user experience is easy to, accept, easy to use. Um, it doesn't crash. It doesn't break. Um, a player can, can start playing it and figure out through the systems of the game how it works, um, what the keys are. You've got good credit screens. We're not necessarily asking for, we're not asking for an art, sound, or music polish, like a, we're not asking for indie level art. 
Um, we're asking for just a level below that, um, a unified level of polish. So everything in the game has the same amount of time, care, effort being put into it. Um, so it doesn't feel uneven and bumpy. It doesn't feel like here's this awesome soundtrack with this really, really terrible art, you know, or you know, here's this really bleepy eight-bit thing with gorgeous hand-painted scenery. You know, it's like that's that's not cohesive. That that that, that we want cohe We want everything to look like it's it's on an even uh, level of quality. This might be a preview for for future lectures, but play ponycorns. Look up the term ponycorn. It's a game made by a five-year-old and her father. Um, that is actually a high level of polish that I've seen happen in this class. And if it happens with your projects, it's gonna, it would be really great. The, yeah. Yes, Sissy's uh, magical, Sissy's Sissy's magical pony corn adventure. Yeah, the, the key thing to note here is that all the assets were created by the five-year-old, and I believe the story was also written by the five-year-old. And the sound. And the sounds were done by her, and her father just did all the coding and put it all together. Yep. What's up? $3,199 of donations to date. Yeah. If you can draw that's, as well that, as a five-year-old, you can make good assets for your game. <laughs> all right. So you've got nine minutes left for the rest of class. Um, capture all of the ideas that you wrote down and mail them to video games at mit.edu. So just whoever took, whoever took a capture of each of these things, um, just turn it into a text file, mail it. Yeah. That's fine. Sure. So we don't get a million here. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, there are a couple of students who aren't in class today, so they may need some. Uh, ex you, know, you might need to help to 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 sort of explain to them what happened today and bring them up to speed, especially if you are like dorm mates or hall mates or something like that. Uh, please help them along uh, and help them get ready so that by Monday, you know, get that conversation going on on on, on online so that they can at least have a clue of which team to join on Monday. The rest of the time is yours.